Ahem. Good day, mate, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. I just had to try that. I always thought I had a little Aussie in me. Well, let's go in the pasture. The cattle are all hanging out in the shade, taking their siesta, chewing their cuds, digesting. Hey, 2007, you come see me. Want to scratch? 2107, you got pooped on. That's what we call the badge of shame. Today is Wednesday in our Monday through Friday stretch of nice weather, and I've been running around working hard, and I'm kind of tired, so in this video, I'm not going to be running around, but I have some topics to cover. I want to talk about some things that come up always when grazing season starts. Mineral for cattle on pasture, fly control, we're going to talk about that some more, um, grass tetany, and bloat on spring pasture. Those things are always important and they have to do all together. You know, mineral is related to grass tetany and bloat is related to pasture and pasture mix is related to both bloat and grass tetany and fly control in my case is related to mineral. So we're gonna cover all that. I'm gonna yak a lot. First an update on fly control, you know. Whenever I mention flies in a video, viewers kind of go nuts. They got all these things they see on other channels and have you tried this and that. I do have a plan in mind and the plan is to try multiple different approaches and then kind of scientifically see which one works the best. Every farm is different. I can't stress that enough. The things that work for me might not work for you. The things that you see on another channel might not work on this farm. So something I've said before but it bears repeating. My fly paper hasn't caught very much and it may be because the fly load is fairly light right now but yesterday I implemented phase two of my fly control plan and that has to do with mineral and it's going to get us into a discussion in general about minerals for cattle on pasture. You saw in the last video that when I first let the cows out, I put a couple mineral salt blocks in here. I don't particularly like mineral salt blocks. I don't feel like they get enough of what they need, especially in the macro minerals out of these mineral blocks. But that's what I had at the time because in the winter, we feed mineral blocks because when the bulls are mixed in with the cows, they have a tendency to push this thing around and sometimes tip it over and knock the mineral out of it because bulls like to use their heads to dig at things. And so I use mineral salt blocks in the winter time. But yesterday, a day after they went out on pasture, I went to my friendly neighborhood fur trail dealer and got kelp. Grazer's Choice and Redmond Garlic Salt. If you're interested, I have a whole video way back in the video library about cattle and minerals and what minerals are required. In short, I don't think that lick blocks do the trick. The cattle just can't take in enough of especially the macro minerals, and I'll get to that in a minute. What I've gotten here, these three things are meant to be complementary. So there's always bulk salt. I've used Redmond salt for years. This year I'm trying garlic salt. That's one compartment. The second compartment is Grazer's Choice, which is made by Fertrell. And that's a pretty good source for macro minerals. And the division between the two is macro minerals you usually see in percentages. These are things that cows need a lot of, things like calcium and phosphorus. And Fertrell's for Grazer's Choice is good at that, as well as some micro minerals like selenium, which is so important to calving and cleaning after calving. The third mineral is kelp, and kelp is a wonderful micronutrient source. It's got all those trace amounts of minerals that you need, plus it's a good source of magnesium. It's about a half a percent by weight magnesium. So those three act in complement, salt, macro minerals, and micro minerals. And micro minerals are usually expressed in parts per million, very trace amounts. Oh, the cattle got up from their siesta. We'll continue our discussion of minerals and how they relate to bloat and tetany after the cattle are moved. We're gonna put them on this field right here, which is the top half of the lower field. And the cattle know what to do. Here they come. Come on, cows. Come on, cows. I love it when I get a response. Come on, cows. Yeah, fresh grass. There we go. Peanut bringing up the rear. Hi, Peanut. 
All right, grass tatany and bloat. Let's cover grass tatany first. Grass tatany is just, it's pretty simple. It's kind of like milk fever. It's a magnesium deficiency. Milk fever is a calcium deficiency. Cattle have plenty of magnesium in their bodies, but it's locked up in their muscles and bones. And a healthy cow is taking in magnesium from forage, and a lot of it's passing through them in the form of manure. Spring forage, this, this young tender stuff, tends to be lower in magnesium than more mature forage. So cattle can suffer a magnesium deficiency when on young grass. Now there's a bunch of things that come in. Your pasture mix is important. Legumes in the young stage will tend to have more magnesium than grasses. So feeding them legumes on spring pasture helps with that magnesium deficit. Also, if you're using chemical fertilizers like nitrogen to fertilize your pasture and you're getting that very fast growth, that grass will tend to be more deficient in magnesium. Yet another reason to use composted manure, which has got all that magnesium, that's passed through the cattle, it's rich in magnesium in itself to fertilize the ground. You're not just focusing on those three, those NPK of chemical fertilizer. You got lots of trace uh, minerals and elements in there that help with providing the pasture ongoing with those trace minerals. There's also genetic factors that lead to a greater risk of grass tatany. Angus and Angus crosses have a greater disposition via their genetics to grass tatany. Our dexters seem very resistant to it. We've never had a case of grass tatany. What does a cow or a steer or whatever look like when they have grass tatany? Well, usually they're laying on the ground dead. It's something that strikes quickly. There are some signs that you can see when the cow is still alive and they're muscle related. Kind of like milk fever, they have problems with their muscles. They have a stiff gait, um, they twitch, and typically, I guess, from what I've read, if you find a dead head of cattle with grass tetany, often there will be scrapes on the ground next to where it's laying, where it's worked its feet back and forth and scratch the ground from that kind of lack of muscle control. But again, every year we turn them out on a spring flush like this. Supplement magnesium using kelp and never had a problem. All right, now let's talk about bloat. And bloat is just what it sounds like. It's trapped gas in the cow's largest stomach called the rumen. There are two types of bloat, free gas bloat and frothy bloat. And I'll get rid of free gas first of all, because that's the simplest one. Free gas bloat is blockage that won't let the, the gas escape from the stomach. That's much less common than frothy bloat. Frothy bloat is a froth that forms in the cow's rumen and so that froth is very small bubbles and the bubbles won't burst and combine into larger bubbles so that the cow can burp them up. Instead they that foam stays there and stays in the rumen and grows outward and you see a swelling on the left side of the cow where the rumen is. Hey buddy. That frothing is can be caused by a number of factors. High protein intake from legume forage can be a cause, and it all relates to the surfactancy of that bubble. That is how difficult the membrane of that bubble is to pop. And uh, higher protein content is one thing. Lack of saliva is another thing, because saliva has built-in compounds that help break those little bubbles. Now, as far as the high protein content goes, of course you're getting con most of your protein on pasture from legumes and there are people that are so scared of bloat that they won't plant any legumes in their pasture and I've always argued that a balanced legume content in the pasture is one of the things that keeps the pasture going as a self-contained system of plants. So, you know, we plant about 40% legumes. Again, we have never ever had a problem with bloat. Sometimes in the late summer, we're feeding up to 60% legumes. And I think once again, genetics has a part in that. The Dexter breed that we raise seem to be resistant to bloat, whereas I hear other farmers, you know, constantly worried about it. There are things you can feed to the cattle to help minimize bloat. It gets pretty pricey, but they're actually kind of surf, not surfactants, anti-surfactants, I guess, that'll break up that foam if you're worried about bloat. But you can see how people would be concerned with bloat because at this young forage stage, remember we learned from the hay testing 
that we did last winter that this younger forage has a higher protein content and that protein content is related to the surfactancy of the foam in the rumen. So the higher protein you're feeding. The other thing that happens is that this is low fiber grass, right? Grass doesn't develop that cellulose fiber until it gets taller than this. So the cattle are chomping it down. It's digesting very easily. They're using less saliva to digest, to lubricate all that they're eating than they would with taller grass. And when you have less saliva in the system, the cow's spending less time chewing, you've got less of that saliva's action on the foam in the rumen, helping to keep the rumen at the right size and helping the cow to expel gas. All right, we're gonna leave these guys. You know, raising a heritage breed cattle like Dexter's eliminates a lot of those race car type problems you have. The analogy with broiler chickens comes to mind where the breed of broilers that we raise, you gotta be very careful about their diet and their environment or they'll die on you. <laughs> and some of the, the big giant beef breeds that are popular now, I think probably some of those drawbacks come with the advantage of that fast growth and they're more race car like than our slower growing Dexters. All right, on to this. I had this stroke of genius last night and I just want to see if it works. I figure that if this is right side up and the flies can read the text, they'll be more likely to land on it. I guess it really doesn't make sense, does it? Well, anyway, I'm trying it on both sides of the board now just to see. I mean, this is all an experiment. I like to prove things for myself and not go so much on what other people say. You guys came back up here already? You must have had full bellies to start with. Go ahead, go in there and get some goodies. All right, other fly control measures. As I mentioned, this is garlic infused salt. And man, oh man, does it stink like garlic. I read a Canadian scientific study, I'm always looking for scientific evidence, that compared cattle that ate this sort of salt along with a control group and found that there were about 50% less flies or fewer flies on the cattle that were fed this salt. I love that kind of data. Other fly control measures. I have jar traps coming in the mail and these are big jars with a way to the flies to get in and then there's a lure inside that comes with it that attracts the flies in. I guess they really stink. You got to handle them with rubber gloves. So I'll be hanging those around here in the grove as well. I do know about parasitic wasps and wasp eggs. I'm reluctant to go to all the trouble of dealing with that. I got a full-time job already here. And yes, I am aware of building tree houses and attracting swallows. We have habitat for birds all the way around our fields. And there is plenty of habitat for tree swallows. If you've ever seen me work the fields, mowing hay, baling hay, there's swallows flying all over the place they can only do so much. Sulfur salt blocks were thought in the old days to be a remedy for flies. <sighs> Don't do that. If cattle get too much sulfur, it's deadly. And there's no proven link between fly control and sulfur. Although sulfur does stink, you would think, well, flies are gonna be drawn to the stink. Sulfur, rotten eggs, instead of being repelled by it. Oh, the lilacs are in bloom. I love the smell of lilacs. See, that's my master plan for fly control. It's all right up here. It has to do with smell, just like I smell these lilacs and I'm attracted to them. I'm using garlic to repel the flies because that's the mechanism. The cows, or the flies don't like the smell, so they don't land on the cattle as much. And then I'm using two lures, fly paper with pheromone on it, and also the jar traps, which are supposed to stink to high heaven with a smell that the flies like. I think that covers it, right? Let's see, mineral, grass tetany, bloat, fly control, moving the cattle, spring pasture qualities and mix, yeah. The other thing about farming is it, it really is a lot of brain work and it gets a bad rap for not being that, but once you get into it, there are levels of complexity. So you can, you can start out farming and not know a lot of these details and you learn on the fly just like you do with anything. I, in my old job, I did this too. You, an issue comes up and you learn all about it and then you carry your knowledge with you. Farming can be really simple and farming can be really complicated. In addition, you know, the things that worked 40, 50, 60 years ago, some work still, some don't because newer, better thinking has come along and I'm always trying to keep up with that and 
that's one of the things that makes life interesting, you know, learning about all this stuff, putting it together, you know, from diverse fields. Farming is all about mechanics and chemistry and animal husbandry and observation. Just so many things come together. That's what makes it exciting. I absolutely love my job as a farmer. I hope you enjoyed this video. I got lots more stuff coming up. Dad and I got to fix, do some major repair on the hay bind. I think that's probably going to be coming next. So I hope you have a great day. Enjoy this nice weather if you're fortunate enough to share the same weather as us. And I'll see you next time.